everybody. It's a gorgeous day to be quarantined in central Pennsylvania. My name is Mrs. Holdren and I'm the pottery teacher at Hughesville High School. So my students and I were pretty bummed that we couldn't spend any more time in the studio and we started looking around at some flour and salt recipes for clay on the internet. They just weren't cutting it. So shout out to my student Ryan who sent me the video on how to make your own clay out of dirt in the stream, out of clay in a stream. And uh, we started the process at that point and we're going on a little journey. Now the video you're going to see today is actually a combination of two efforts. The first effort where I went to get clay from a local stream was a complete disaster. Hashtag epic fail. So I did the entire process again exactly the same, only this time I made sure I got some real clay. So let's go get some clay. Driving the bomb. Creek. It does not belong to me, about three miles from my house, but they let people fish in here all the time, so I'm assuming they won't mind giving up a little bit of clay. Now here's the important part. You're looking for something that looks like this. It'll appear kind of grayer than the rest of the dirt, and this is some clay you can see right there in the ground. It's different. That's what you're looking for. Okay, so now we're at the point where we have to separate the mud from the debris like the rocks, so I'm going to fill my bucket with water like she did. Now I gotta stir it up. If you use the glove, I'm gonna use this peeled stick. After you pour, that's what you'll have left at the bottom, a collection of okay. rocks. So I had to go get this from my kitchen to get out the really big stuff. Um, and then I'll go back to the pantyhose like later, but for now, this is working to get the big stuff out. That's all the organic stuff that I don't want down the clay. And I'm going to keep pouring it in here and draining it out into there and pouring it in there and draining it out in there. And Straining out the organic material and the larger particles is really important. I first started with pantyhose, but it was just too fine. The kitchen strainer worked out great. So this what was left of our bucket. And I'm gonna stir it again. I'm really stirring it so that it gets combined and all the sand will be left down at the bottom. So now you start the process of getting the sand away from the clay. So you have to stir it so it's well mixed and then pour so that only the sand is left behind. And you do this several times. So after you pour, that's what you get. You can see the sand remains behind while all the water in the clay has been poured out. Okay, now we let it sit and we let all the water scoot to the top while the clay goes to the bottom. Check in with you later. In this shot, you can barely see where the water stops and the clay begins at the bottom. The first bucket, it was much easier to see. Okay, so we're back here in the clay making scene and um, this is the bucket of clay that I poured back and forth, back and forth to get all the sand out of. And then I let it sit overnight, um, two days actually, until I can actually see this layer right here I don't know if you can see that through the bucket, but it's a totally different color. I think the clay has settled down to here and the water is here. Um, the dog is still helping, as you can see. Um, we are going to get rid of this water on the top 
in the video he does one where he pours it off and in the other one he siphons it and I'm gonna use a siphon because I think that that looked a little bit safer in terms of being able to get everything off of the top that I want to get off without accidentally pouring off too much clay. Um, I have to put the bucket on top of a bucket because I want gravity to help me use the siphon. Um, no idea where this tubing came from. <laughs> And uh, we're gonna we're gonna hope that this I don't inhale something really bad when I start sucking the water up. So here it goes. Okay. I just gotta keep my end in there without getting too far down on the clay. Oop, just sucked some air out. So I'm trying to make sure I don't get down too low, but I'm gonna I'm gonna actually keep my eye on this too, because I think that'll help me. I just don't want to get my siphon down on the actual clay. While I was drying it, I um, had it covered with the pantyhose so that nothing new could jump in there. No more dirt or anything like that. Every now and then I can see a little bit of clay go through and I know I'm down too deep. All right, I did it. That worked like a charm. Sweet. Okay. And now my goal is to pour that into that. Uh, this is a bucket that I have prepared with a towel. Like he said in the video, I only have one layer of towel because I didn't feel like wasting a huge big towel. His kept slipping in, so I duct taped mine around the outside while packing tape. Hopefully that's strong enough to keep it from sinking down in. And hopefully I have enough of a bowl shaped here to accept the clay and it won't run over the top. Um, I don't know, that's going to be kind of close, so we'll see how that works out. But this is my next step, is to pour it into here. If it will even pour, I don't know, it looks really... Oh yeah, it'll pour, barely maybe. Now the second batch, where I actually had real clay and water in the bucket, it poured out super easy. Oh, I'm going to have to get it out with my hand. Yeah. And all the fibers in the towel will hopefully absorb some of this water. And uh, we'll have some clay in a couple hours, maybe. So the first time, no, it was dirt and it was like making a glorified mud pie. Not good. But the second time, I actually had clay. I could wedge it in everything. I know you've all probably made pinch pots and coil pots, and that's what I made most of, but I also made some slump pots, as you can see there. The clay didn't have a lot of plasticity, so I had to stuff newspaper in it or support it in other ways, and I thought the gravity would be great for a slump pot. Next, it was time to fire it outside in a pit firing. So we used our fire ring out back and I dug down into the ground to make a pit. I didn't have many pots so it didn't have to be too deep. Because this was a bisque firing and usually I let the pots heat a little bit before actually firing them. So I put my pots in the oven all day on low at 180 degrees. That gave them a chance to thoroughly dry out just in case there was any moisture left over. And it also reduced the amount of shock when they went into the fire. Now one of the things you can do with a pit fire is add chemicals or materials that react in fire to create beautiful colors and patterns. I've seen gorgeous examples of this and I was very excited to try it myself. Combustibles. <laughs> Steel wool. And calcium carbonate. For calcium carbonate, I smashed up seashells that I had left over from the beach. Hair. Bits of copper. If it oxidizes, it should make a green mark. Okay. And Some Himalayan pink salt. Oh, Gatsby got in it. Yay! They're in all my videos. So now we have a newspaper. And this is where my friend Emily uses her cool new plasma lighter to light our fire. You can hear it, it goes tss. In my bag, if we want to use them. I think this will be good. These sticks should go right up. In flames. 
Okay, now we're just gonna keep on adding wood. I kept building the fire up as hot as possible. As soon as it would burn down like this, I would add more small stuff to make it flame up again and to keep it very hot. I had to do this multiple times during the firing. Finally, five hours later, it was almost 10 o'clock at night. Here we go, five hours later, we're down to coals. It's almost time to pile on the dirt. I had lots of time to reflect watching the fire and the beautiful stars out. So I was hopeful the next day, but no matter what happened, it would have been a great experience. Okay. So that's what my dirt pile looks like. There we go. And I'm gonna start shoveling a little bit of it away at a time. I'm not going to do dialogue. I'll just do that later. Do you think? So you better stop digging and just go in with your hands. Right. What if it's hot? It's not going to be hot. Yeah, that was a pot. I think. Yeah. That's the corner of the same pot. Okay, so this is off one of my pots. I know that's the little ball top. There we go, there we go. <gasps> Yay! <laughs> huh! It lost all of its little balls around the top, but I didn't slip and score them very well, so. Huh. Yeah. Mm. That one's broken. Yeah. Right there. Okay, I'm go over there and get it. I can't even see where it was anymore. Right there, right? Yep. There it is. Ouch. Hot. Woo! <laughs> so I guess it was a little anticlimactic. There were lots of broken pieces, but at least two of the pots retained their shapes. Funny, but they were the worst pots I made. Kind of too heavy on the bottom and really thick. And none of this, like, even all the stuff that I put in for, like, like, there's actually the shells and stuff. It didn't really burn up to make, like, a chemical reaction. This is really hot still. Actually, it has a crack, but it's only one piece. All right. Well, that's the, that's the failed experiment. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> all right. Thanks. So here's the collection overall. On that pot in the top, you can really see the difference between the white and gray areas, where some chemical change was obviously happening, but you can also see how damaged the other pieces were. Even the ones that didn't break were pretty fragile even then. I wouldn't have been able to cook or eat out of them, so. Looking back on this whole process, it's pretty amazing that primitive peoples were able to make so many beautiful things. So I can't wait to get back in the studio again and see all my students. But I hope some of you guys decide to try this method of making clay. And I hope you let me know how it works out. Have a great day. See ya. Mm -hmm.